Hello and welcome to episode 69 of the Market Maker podcast. And in this episode, we've had Apple's developer event earlier this week. And while a lot of people are pretty obsessed about augmented reality technology, we're not actually going to talk about the hardware side because not a great deal came to light. We're going to talk about Apple software. Sounds pretty boring, but it's actually could be quite a big deal in the revenue streams for the tech giant. Apple CarPlay and also Apple Finance talking about the whole new buy now, pay later product that they're coming to market with. And then secondly, we're going to focus on Ray Dalio. Probably seen him peddling his latest book <laughs> more recently. Um, but again, he's out in force. Why? Because Bridgewater, the firm he's obviously closely linked with, is back in the spotlight betting on a sell off in corporate bonds this year. Uh, underscoring their gloomy view on the trajectory of the global economy for what they see going forward. Uh, but before we begin, um, if you're listening to this in audio form on the podcast and not via video, you won't be able to see. But Piers, I'm going to, is that a virtual background? That looks like one of those Zoom preset virtual backgrounds going on there. Where are you? There's no virtual backgrounds here. Uh, that they are real palm trees uh, in my background thanks very much uh yeah I, i'm just so happen to be uh, palm beach florida okay what is this a pimp pimco or is this what, what's going on here you meeting uh who's there now bill gross or who are you hanging with i'm actually hanging with the citadel crew um, okay we're we're out here helping them run their summer intern program actually um so this is yeah it's pretty i mean it's pretty cool it's pretty phenomenal what citadel put on for their interns i mean they they so their main offices are new york and chicago but they flat at the start of their 10 week intern program they week one is in florida on the beach <laughs> uh, so they fly about 250 students down to florida you know book out the entire four seasons and um there is tra so there's training every day right um and then they you know it's like to kick off the um intern program and it's a lot of networking events getting to know all the other students and then they have a lot of inspirational speakers so so check this out you know so tuesday um headline speaker uh michael phelps um the as you do yeah, the greatest the, Olympiad of them all. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, so he rocked up just to have a chat, you know. Um, and actually, what I was talking to the, I, I wasn't here for that, unfortunately. I only arrived uh, yesterday, but um, it was actually really interesting. I was talking to the the Citadel team running, you know, running the program, and um, just about that Michael Phelps thing. And because you know, he's the biggest. Well, he's just a legend, right? An Olympian uh, record. What are, what are the number of golds? What, what are the stats? 20, you... 23 golds. Yeah. Three silvers, two bronze. I mean, that is obviously just extraordinary. Um, and He's still not the greatest Olympiad, though. Ooh. Do you know who it's is? It's the greatest summer Olympiad, though, no? Okay, well, well I'm, I'm sticking with summer then. He's, he's... he's not. You're saying he's not? No, great. he's not. No, definitely not. Oh, you what? You mean, well, he is based on medal stats. But he's not. He's not. He's obviously no Steve Redgrave, surely. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with that, actually. <laughs> Redgrave, five, five goals, five games, just one gold per game. He's but yeah, the boss. I guess, Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but five versus 23. 28 uh, total medals. Yeah. 28 total, yeah. All right. Not but bad. anyway... The, the point I was going to make was he. So what was he talking about to these Citadel interns? He wasn't talking. It wasn't about how amazing he is and, and winning mindsets and, and stuff. It wasn't about that. It was actually about post Olympic retiring and actually it was about mental health and it was about depression and how he had experienced quite a sharp, you know, fall into depression following his retirement i mean i guess these these kind of uber successful people that especially athletes right where your career ends and you're still mm. young 
relatively. I mean, you go from everything to then, right, what am I going to do now? And uh, and the kind of fall off the pedestal is almost impossible to deal with, I guess. And so he was talking about, you know, mental strength and, you know, overcoming adversity. And obviously a lot of these, a lot of the roles that these interns at Citadel are, are trying to get, obviously they're only on their 10 week summer program, right? These aren't full-time hires, but, you know, Citadel, is a, it's a, they're a market maker and they're a hedge fund. It's very markets, you know, your frontline markets roles. Um, and so, you know, it's about dealing with mindset around dealing with um, loss, dealing with adversity, dealing with, you know, really challenging situations. And, and he, so he was talking about how he'd overcome mm. those kind of post success sort of um, depression period and, and and come through it so yeah he, he's now on a big mission to really help you know with mind with with mental health generally but particularly amongst you know the younger age group so hmm. very interesting yeah shame you missed that it would have been great to get yeah his take but um but yeah look yeah. i'm sure you'll get some intel over the coming days uh in and around your activity in the four seasons and palm trees but let's <laughs> uh <laughs> First things first, a quick shout out to um, our summer analysts. They've started uh, the first cohort is in for Amplify Me, which is great. And um, yeah, great to have them with us. They're on the buy side week. So they're doing an asset management sim right now. Uh, I've been with them working in the, the kind of futures market, talking about more intraday cross asset class, event driven new stuff today. So yeah, it's been great to get them stuck in. Um, some good and bad results so far in terms of people's uh, <laughs> risk adherence to risk protocols let's call it yeah. but, uh, all part of the learning journey um, well actually on the, well the quant sim that we're running for citadel tomorrow mm. for their interns here in miami that um yeah the summer analysts on our program they'll be doing that exact simulation next week cool well yeah, yeah i mean can't wait to see the the matchup the results um yeah how they cut it and so, yeah, check out the show notes, more information about um, some of that, that training that we do. But um, before I begin, do, if you enjoy this episode or any previous ones, rate and review the show, It'd be much appreciated, whether that's Spotify, Apple, wherever you consume this and uh, yeah, share it with a friend, get the word out, really appreciate it. But look, let's get straight to it. Let's talk about Apple. So Apple announced a complete refresh of CarPlay to better connect with the car's instrument panel and a deep integration with the vehicle itself. I promise I am not an Apple representative. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm an Apple salesman here. Uh, but CarPlay users will be able to swap what they see on their instrument panel with a very Apple-looking widget design. So it can be bespoke. You know, the way that a lot of these interfaces are heading is to have it so you want it in terms of the modular setup, the color palette, and all these different types of things. So there's the video you should check it out it's quite um doesn't quite float my boat because it looks um a bit gimmicky um in my opinion but um, you should have a look it was the, the wwdc is the developer conference you can just check out the video on youtube it's worth a look um but apple's been working obviously internally on an electric autonomous vehicle but the company is as we've discussed on the pod many times setback after setback executive yes. departure after executive departure they find it incredibly tough to retain talent when someone like alphabet is quite compelling as a place to go as an engineer because their breadth of project work um how advanced they are then there's tesla who are the market leader in a lot of these fields and technology as it stands um, but manufacturers are said to be already looking to integrate the new generation that they're talking about of carplay just a couple names Ford, Audi, Jaguar, Land Rover, Nissan, Volvo, Polestar. These are just a couple. They're already yeah. on board. Yeah, you might um, have heard of them. Yeah. Stat for you. Apple oh. says 98% of all new cars already have CarPlay. And 79% of users consider the feature before they purchase a car. Stats origination from apple <laughs> well, hang on hang on what 98 percent? 98 percent of all new cars right. already have carplay so why would 79 percent of people have that as a, a a real priority when they're choosing a car if all cars have got it 
I guess the interaction of the um, friction between you and the life that you have built into you via your yeah. phone and it's seamless yeah. um, trans- transfer yeah. to your automobile, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just thoughts on that first to start off with. Um, you know, what do you think? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's so Apple have kind of, they've got a two pronged attack when it comes to this whole electric vehicle strategy. Um, the one, one, so the one prong has been so far, well, let's, let's be straightforward, a pretty, pretty much a failure. So this is their Titan project, which is to build their own car. Um, and I mean, here's some stats, because you mentioned um, Google there. And so Google's um, Waymo sort of um, driverless vehicle, is it, so not electric vehicle, I meant driverless vehicle, right? So this is the race to produce driverless vehicles and um you know apple well in 2019 they acquired um drive.ai which was a self-driving car startup um and that kind of bolted onto what they were already doing and they were hoping that was going to accelerate their their kind of or help them leapfrog ahead on this self-driving car race but you know it's been a bit of a disaster and and just in 2021 i think they only their, their kind of prototypes only managed to do i think well, um, 19,000 uh, autonomous miles. So compare that to like Waymo's that they did 630,000 autonomous miles. And so obviously with these kind of new projects, the, the miles under the belt is what you want, right? Because then you're getting data and it's all about that kind of machine learning with more data, you feed that back in and then the algorithm's cleverer and the, you know, the whole automated driving um, bot then becomes a better driver and so on, right? Um, but look, they, for whatever reason, they just haven't really been able to kind of get that going. So their second prong is forget about building an actual car. Um, it's, this, it's the software that goes into it. And, and this, you know, is almost the exact opposite. This is seemingly incredibly successful. And I think this step they've announced with this update is certainly looking pretty interesting for Apple. Um, what I mean, what I'd say is, I know people are getting quite excited about this. We'll talk about Tesla in a minute, but you've got people saying like, this is the, this is the end of Tesla, um, which I think is a little bit sensationalist. Um, but basically this car, if you've, I don't know, people listening to this, I don't know if you're drivers, I don't know if you own vehicles, but um, CarPlay as it stands was actually launched in 2014. So Apple's CarPlay was launched in 2014. Um, I've got it in my car do i use it no me i mean <laughs> i don't know whether that says more about me than yeah we're the apple we're, product we're, yeah, probably we've, does we've, yeah, but, we've rolled over pierce we're on the... but, but what i would say is the apple the car play at the moment I, I, I don't think it's particularly good and it really doesn't do much other than connect your iphone and you can whatever make calls and access your music and right bog standard stuff um so you know what's exciting i guess about this this kind of new upgrade is that you know it's going to give apple more access to to much much more interesting and potentially way more valuable data about how someone's operating a car you know about how the car's performing um and and i guess one of the key things here is that people are kind of starting to to look into the future about is right is this actual is this driving data that apple can harvest to feed into their Titan project and help them accelerate this self-drive car initiative. That's the one key thing Tesla have above all others in this race. It's the amount of data that Tesla are able to kind of pull down from all of their vehicles. And as I was saying before, there's no substitute for miles under the belt to learn from and feed into your machine learning process. So. I guess people are getting quite excited about that. I mean, what I'd say is don't this new car play, it's not available till, well, they're saying at the moment, late 2023. Um, so let's just say 2024 and fine. If, and then great. And, and maybe it will get rolled out. I think right now, the car play as it stands, you mentioned the big names. I mean, they're, they're across most car companies. And I think there's 600 different car models. Mm that have CarPlay um, 
interestingly, the absolute noticeable absentee from the list is definitely Tesla. So Tesla have always been very anti-Apple. I mean, this kind of goes back. I mean, Musk has got a bit of beef um, with Tim Cook. Um, they've got a bit of a history. And this kind of goes back to stuff like um, Apple poaching uh, Tesla kind of staff, basically. <laughs> and um, Musk famously once said that uh, he called Apple the Tesla graveyard. Yeah. Basically said, look, if you don't make it here at Tesla, then, you know, you go and work at Apple. Um, and obviously Tim Cook didn't like those types of comments particularly well. So, look, so there's zero Apple in a Tesla. Um, and they're pretty much the only ones. You go to all the other car, big char, car giants and Apple's part of it, right? And, and I guess one of the quite unique things about Tesla is that they're basically, I don't know how many, like five or six different companies in one because Tesla built their own operating system from scratch, from the ground up. Now, that is a fantastically difficult thing to do. All these other cars, they've tried it and spectacularly failed. I don't know if you've ever been frustrated by the operating systems in, in some of these vehicles. And it's so bad. It's so clunky. It's incredibly difficult to navigate around especially when you're driving at the same time right it's actually just kind of downright dangerous so i think there's a huge play here for apple who have obviously got the operating system down to an absolute t one of the you know along with android the two big giant operating systems on the planet and if and if apple can continue to offer these big car companies you know the off operating system off the shelf um and of course with the whatever 1.4 billion is it apple active users or iPhone users, mm. um, you know, clearly that's a, that's a positive feature when people are buying cars, especially if there's a more advanced Apple operating system available to make your drive, driving experience, you know, to ha enhance your driving experience. So mm. look, I think this is incredibly interesting for Apple. This CarPlay thing's been around for ages. I don't think it's really, really done much for apple at this point but i think this looks exciting but we've got to wait until 2024 um and then it's only in new vehicles right so it's going to take a decade maybe for this new car play operating system to be you know in a large portion of vehicles on the road and then all that data that could be valuable to start coming through so you know, I don't think Tesla have got too much to worry about in the near term. Um, but yeah, definitely oh, a positive. Pra pragmatic as ever. Oh, so boring, Piers. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. VW will see to Tesla before the car play kills them. So <laughs> oh, yes. it's fine. Absolutely. Um, no, it's interesting. I, I, just, just to bolt on to what you said, I think um, there's a lot of unknown um data here in terms of from a legal perspective i yeah. get it auto manufacturers will i think it makes sense to outsource almost that tricky proposition of nailing down your own ios and you want to think with user in mind that's that simplicity of being able to then such a large portion of people with apple product to have that individual bespoke experience almost enhances your product offering as a car i get that but if i was the auto manufacturer and you start talking, you mentioned the word data harvesting of my <laughs> user, I'm going to be like, well, no, that's a line by line, data digit by digit, like agreement that we don't know at all yeah. how that stands. So it's all well and good saying, okay, yeah, it's about the mileage and the accumulation of data, but what data will they be allowed to have? And yeah. then you bring in the regulatory concern of what you're telling me that there's like, 1.4 billion people and i know it's a fraction amount that will be driving cars to take data from but what you're allowing app that you think the regulators will allow apple to just like gobble all that up with no you know at least confrontation with the with the politicians i don't know i just think it's there's a lot yeah. there to to leap over before you hit that holy grail outcome which is yeah a, a a new revenue stream of a addressable market of 450 million like people or, or in Western yeah. developed nations. I think, yeah, I get it. It's exciting. I like it. And I like the idea of 
um, the services side, perhaps maybe, okay, this is out of the box. Maybe this is a deflection tactic away from their non-deliverable um, target of AR, VR updates from a hardware perspective. Let's just throw it out a little car play 2014 little V2 spin, get people yeah. excited about that, buys us another few months to just work away at this project. Actually, we're finding is much more tricky proposition, which is this whole meta uh, and augmented reality space. And yeah. no, you're calling me the, the kind of dull pragmatist. <laughs> um, but you're, you're right. Um, I mean, well, it depends. <laughs> It depends. Apple's so in some ways quite diversive in that you've got your Apple Uber fans, mm. and it's uh, that Apple can do no wrong. And if you're on that side of the fence, then the way to explain why they haven't rolled out any of this um, AR stuff, or is that they've got so much great innovative new products that actually there wasn't really room in this conference to, to actually now bring in all that stuff. There's so much other stuff that's amazing that's going on that they, you would argue that they kind of push that to the next one because they can. Um, obviously your, your spin on it's on the opposite side of the fence, which I probably, I'm, I'm with you to be honest, but, um, but yeah, you're right. Going back to that data harvesting, of course it is a conflict of interest for the big automotive vehicles to, you know, hand Apple, um, all this data. So yeah, I mean, you're right. It's it's not quite as, you know, this isn't the sort of highway uh, into the sunset for Apple to kind of just clean up. Um, but one thing, you know, on the, well, again, it comes back to whether they can get the actual data or not, but, you know, stuff like, it's not just about driverless vehicles and harvesting data to kind of put into that. It's the other interesting one was like stuff like car insurance, mm. Um, and so if you can track how people are driving, you know, most like in real time, then that can feed into a, a much more kind of clever car insurance sort of system where you're paying maybe your monthly premium mm. actually is entirely based on how you're driving the car. And the, the better driver you are, the kind of the lower the premium gets. And that's quite that's kind of where that's what the future of insurance looks like. Right. And so that's quite. That's quite an interesting play, especially given Apple's, and here's a kind of segue for you into our next um, topic, um, you know, especially given Apple's, you know, obvious growing, um, obvious move more into that kind of finance um, kind of world with, with their um, Apple Pay. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting one, that insurance product suite that could be there for the future, new future revenue streams. Uh, maybe that could bail me out when my wife tells me I, I drive like a granddad. I can say, look, I'm just taking care of our personal finances for the, for the better of our family's future. <laughs> but um, yeah, you mentioned yeah. Apple. They're making that that kind of move uh, in, into a little bit more in the finance space by offering loans directly to consumers for its new buy now, pay later product, taking on a role played in other lending services by partners that they they work closely with like Goldman Sachs for example so well, what's what's going on here what what's the involvement between well first of all they're doing buy now pay later yeah um uh, which we talked about before yeah so what well, it's um it's it's spreading uh, what what's the amount is it up to 600 it's up to a thousand dollars, am I right to say? I can't remember what the ceiling is, but anyway, you spread. You can now you'll, you'll be able to spread your payments over four installments over six weeks. Okay, so yeah, very much striding right into the middle of the buy now, pay later market, which is a monster, huge market um, at the moment. And you know, it's like you know the clowners of this world. Well. This is, yeah, this is really bad news, to be quite frank. Um, but look, I don't think this is, this isn't a surprise, this kind of move, because we were talking about this earlier in the year, but uh, Apple acquired, they made an acquisition back in March and they acquired a company called Credit Kudos, um, which um, essentially is a, a kind of clever new bit of software. So, but 
which is around credit scoring. Okay, so one of the things about this buy now, pay later space, you want a seamless as possible user experience, right? So if you're on your iPhone, you want to buy something and you want to go for this spread the payments option, then obviously you, you don't want to be messing about with, oh, you try and hit buy and then it goes, okay, um, payment pending, you know, a credit rating, right? A credit check. And then what, that credit check takes, what, 24 hours, and then you've got to come back to the product and hang on, did I get, did I pass, did I not, have I bought this thing, have I not bought it, you know, so you want a seamless, so you want a pretty much as rapid a kind of credit check scenario as possible. And I think, what, what and, and that happens, right, with the Klarna's of this world, it's super fast, but I guess the problem that people, consumers are facing is that the way that credit checks happen they're quite they're still still quite backwards looking so the data that they're using for your credit score you know is is your kind of you know all quite quite kind of i guess looking at your bank statements and looking at your payment history for loans in the past and you know it could be that it's you know the way they credit check you isn't particularly uh, kind of relevant to perhaps your financial situation in the moment you're clicking that button to try and buy it. It might be based more on your financial situation six months ago. And what the frustration people are finding is they get refused credit, even though right now today, actually they're a healthy consumer. And, you know, if it was based on today's evidence, they'd get it, but it's based on historic stuff. So Apple bought this company, uh, Credit Qdos, whose software is a much more clever, much more real-time, much more up-to-date way of checking people's credit history. One of which is actually you <laughs> checking their, um, their mobile phone uh, monthly contract, for example. Are you, you know, and obviously Apple have got all the data. So this is about, right, do you have a monthly contract with Apple? Have you always been, you know, on top of payments? Add on to the fact that for Apple, I mean, Apple products are quite premium. So actually, if you're an Apple, user then almost by definition you're probably a more affluent person um and so obviously from a buy now pay later if you're going to get into that credit game where you're you're basically lending money so apple are now lent they're a lender and obviously mm. you're going to get people defaulting and once you're into that game you know that's a big issue what's the kind of percentage default rate but for apple i guess their can their, their customers you know, are probably in the more affluent category given they can afford iPhones. Um, and so this is kind of all tying into a move that had been telegraphed for months and months and months and months, and now it's here. And it's been a, such a slow motion rollout, I have to say, um, in terms of them finally entering this space. Um, so now, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they execute it. Yeah, so with the, the hookup then and with Goldman's, so Goldman's is facilitating Apple Pay later by allowing basically the tech company to access MasterCard's network since the iPhone maker lacks a license to issue payment credentials directly. But Apple is handling the underwriting and lending using its new subsidiary. So that new subsidiary wholly owned by Apple is called Apple Financing. Yeah. Uh, essentially. So that's how the two kind of hook up and, and, and work with one another in that way. So yeah, yeah and just, I guess from the bank, I guess just one point on the banks, hmm. you know, I, I get because obviously to operate as a bank and to be a lender, um you have to have a kind of balance sheet uh, of assets that you of deposits, if you like, you know, historically the way a bank works in terms of lending money, you have deposits. Um, from your kind of current account users. And that's the kind of capital that kind of goes against that kind of lending process, right? Obviously, Apple aren't a bank. But so rather than deposits, just so happens Apple have got $73 billion in cash just sat on their balance sheet, <laughs> just because they're such a crazy kind of cash generative business. And so they, they almost are a bank, but just a very different, <laughs> a very different one. And I think, you know, this is... This is huge for Apple. As I said, this isn't new. So it's not like the Apple share price is suddenly spiking because, oh my God, this is amazing. And they're going to, this has been so telegraphed. And you could argue it's been negative for their share price because it's taken them so long to, to actually get here. So, um, but yeah, I mean, for Apple, this is, 
it, you know, in the years to come, this is going to become, uh, you know, definitely a, a very, a, a, the growth rate of this part of their business, which is now financing, mm. um, the growth rate of this part of their business will be very interesting to watch um, and, and definitely will add a, you know, a big new powerful revenue stream. Okay, so look, let's just move off Apple and let's talk a little bit more markets oriented with using the new Bridgewater call on markets, which is they've warned that inflation could be far stickier than economists and the market are currently predicting. You might sort of question that and go, well, you th- how do you think you're so right? Well, I was reading, I think it's their, I mean, the full name of it, their Alpha Fund. Pure, al- pure alpha, love that. It's not just alpha, pure alpha <laughs> fund at Bridgewater. Um, it manages $151 billion in assets as of the start of the year, probably higher. Why? Because year to date, their fund is up 26.2%. You might have seen a meme, very popular one, go around the market this week. And it's a picture of this guy who looks like Ronald McDonald at McDonald's investing in the stock market in 21 and, he, and he's just having a party. And then it's a second image of a guy in a suit looking at loads of technical screens and his, and his accounts crashing 2022. Yeah. The point being is, is that, you know, without you know, carrying the joke through, Ronald McDonald could make money in 21 when the market was going up. Now it's a little bit more of a tricky proposition. But, yeah. you know, they've done... You know, twenty six point two percent in in those conditions, which is pretty phenomenal. So yep. what they're saying is, is they're quite bearish, and uh, that then is a reflection of the fact that they think that the Federal Reserve are going to have to hike rates harder, faster, higher. I guess in summary, and that's going to cause complications. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of deconstruct how they kind of pull together a view. Um, what are the sort of signals do you think that they'd look at? And that kind of constitutes around timing, I guess, to exercise this view. And then about how do they structure this? How do you, um, because this is something we've been working with the analysts with this week. It's kind of like, these aren't just outright positions. They're more complex in their nature of how they try to then minimize risk, but optimize the profit potential of that investment strategy. So yeah, yep. just going to get a bit of a walkthrough, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, so this, so Ray Dalio, who's Bridgewater chief, um, is one of, the, you probably, I mean, obviously hugely successful, hugely over the decades, one of the most successful investors of all time. Um, but certainly in recent years, you know, he's been very much about the big, you know, debt cycles, right? The boom and bust kind of massive debt cycles and the rise and fall of superpowers. You know, this is his his book on on debt cycles that he's been kind of masterminding and and peddling. I mean, most of his time spent selling books these days, it appears. But, you know, the point is that he's been, I guess, predicting what's happening. He's been predicting it for years. And I think, and to be fair to him, he wasn't like saying, it's not that in 2019 he was saying right in 2020 and in 2021 all the stuff i'm predicting is going to happen he didn't say that he said look these are ultra long cycles it's incredibly hard to pinpoint the precise timing but of course then covid happened which was obviously completely out of left field and this was the catalyst for him saying well actually what tends to happen at the end of these massive cycles is there's a major shock event and then that triggers everything into motion when we transition and have this big downturn. And, and he you know, was definitely saying COVID appears to be probably a big event that might well accelerate this. So bearing in mind, he's been of that persuasion for quite a while in terms of looking for when is the correction going to start? And, and he thinks it's going to be more than a correction. So the fact they've outperformed this year is definitely of no surprise. They probably underperformed last year, by the way. Um, because they were probably more bearish and markets obviously did incredibly well last year. So now their bearish view is coming through and it's looking incredibly positive when you're comparing their performance against everyone else's. What's interesting though is now we here we are in the summer of 2022 and you're actually starting to get some 
notable investors, some banks actually starting to come out and say, well, maybe, maybe we're past the worst, you know, and starting, you know, and, and you can point towards stuff like the Fed, you know, rate hike expectations that were uber hawkish a few months back have calmed down a little bit. Um, and, you know, there's not going to be 75 basis point rate hikes or anything ridiculous like that. And so, um, and, and with that, you're getting some analysts go, well, actually, maybe we're, maybe this is the bottom. and Maybe the second half of the year could be a recovery for stock markets. And remember, stock markets are always, they're lead indicators, they're forward looking. So it, it might be that we still get a recession. It could be, well, I don't know, do we get a recession in the US at the end of the year? Possibly. But the stock market could bottom out or normally bottoms out before the recession because we're kind of forward looking. OK, um, so what's interesting to me is here we are middle of the year and they're now almost like doubling down on this bearish view. So that's the that's the key takeaway here. Whilst others are starting to say, right, the worst is behind us. They're coming out and going, nope, absolutely not. And actually, we think this is going to be this is going to get worse. So they're, they're probably moving more, maybe, well, I don't want to say the contrarian camp. I think it's quite divided at the moment out there in the marketplace as to whether we've seen the worst or not. Um, but yeah, well done to them for this year and positioning correctly. I mean, for sure, obviously, the inflation conundrum is the hardest one to predict. We've got some incredibly important uh, US data on this tomorrow. So we're recording this on Thursday. So Friday, um, 1 30 p.m uh, kind of uk time we've got us cpi report so this is another inflation update for the month of may and what we've seen is that i guess the question is has inflation peaked and it looks like it has because the april figure was lower than the month before and, we, and this, so this will be the next this is a key moment i think do do we now see two months of declining headline cpi in a row that's what people are thinking and expecting and if that's the case then maybe Bridgewater are wrong. And actually maybe this camp who think the worst is behind us are right. But for Bridgewater, they want to see a super high inflation print tomorrow because their view is inflation, this inflation crisis is going to last longer than markets are currently pricing. Therefore, they think the Fed and other central banks will have to hike more to control that inflation. Then you feed into how they're positioning themselves for this view and that is based around the corporate bond market. Because in the end, if they're right, and interest rates have to go up really quickly, much higher than markets are currently pricing, then if you're a borrower, and if your balance sheet, or if you're, and, and, well, and if you're a borrower and you hit a recession, <laughs> and rates are suddenly jumping higher, well, that's a recipe for disaster. Right. That's a recipe for companies literally going to the wall and going bankrupt. And how many and we call these zombie companies, right? How many zombie companies are out there that have been able to survive in the last decade? They're not really growing. They've got a huge amount of debt, which is just keeping them alive. And it's fine whilst interest rates are zero. But when they're not zero, it's not fine and they'll go under. So how quickly do these zombie companies get stripped out of the system? And Bridgewater think it's going to be a rapid and very painful um, scenario of sharply higher rates. And so they're in the corporate bond market space. And, and look, this, they haven't expressed exactly how they've set up this trade, but mm. there's certainly a lot of derivatives involved. So there's stuff like, you know, the good old credit default swaps, which uh, if you were around in the, Great financial crisis back in 2008 um, was the kind of the kind of market to be monitoring. But this is where you, you, you can buy derivatives that go up in value, you know, if the creditworthiness of a company deteriorates. And so that's kind of their angle, right? Higher rates, these companies that aren't in good shape, that have got a lot of debt, their credit ratings are going to get chopped their creditworthiness is going to decline as they move towards bankruptcy and the credit default swap pricing, that's insurance against default, the pricing of that goes through the roof. And so you can use these kind of derivative instruments to profit from that kind of downtrend in creditworthiness. So it may be that they've kind of got positioned in amongst that. There's also, yeah, 
And so there's also clever things you can do around spreads. So that's looking at the spread between yields um, on... So again, thinking about credit ratings, right? The whole debt market is based on this credit rating system. Um, so you've got the Standard and Poor's and the Moody's and the Fitch's of this world. They're the big three kind of global credit rating agencies. And their job is to do a deep dive analysis into a company that issues corporate bonds to borrow money. And they give them a rating based on their financial health and therefore their credit worthiness, right? Um, and so, you know, the... the the worse your credit rating, well, the, the more expensive it is to borrow, of course, um, because there's a higher risk for the lender. So you, the yield on these corporate bonds that have a lower rating, the yields are higher. And we often look at the spread between, well, what's the difference between the yield of a corporate company that's got a credit rating of triple C compared to a company like Apple, let's say, who's like triple A, and what's the difference in the yield? And that's the spread. And if Bridgewater are right, what will happen is these spreads will widen as the yields on the high risk stuff gets a lot higher. The apples of this world will be the safe haven, right? So the yields on those will stay where they are, anchored and low. And so you can kind of tr place these spread trades to profit from the spread widening. So there's lots of clever ways you can engineer a position around this, but ultimately they just think that, you know, borrowers are going to get squeezed as rates go higher. There's going to be a lot of bankruptcies and they think the crisis is, is still ahead of us. Cool. Well, I won't end it there because that's a sour note. So a quick, a great summary as ever. And we'll, we'll have a quick word on the ECB. Um, Oh, yeah. mindful of as you said we're recording this on thursday the event is still kind of happening while we're talking but the initial take was that these be kept rates on hold very much as expected so deposit rate negative 0.5 but they said they intend to raise the interest rate by 25 basis points at its july meeting and they'll expect to raise again in september the kicker at the beginning in a statement was quote if in the medium term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates a large increment, it will be appropriate at the September meeting to potentially, they're talking about essentially going bigger. Yeah. Um, the euro actually rallied um, in the initial statement. However, uh, well, to finish that part off, it was accompanied by their latest projections. So every alternate meeting, uh, they release them kind of in a similar fashion to the, to the Fed. So every calendar quarter, and the end of year inflation target they bumped up. It's now tracking at 6.8%. Last time in March when they issued these, it was at 5.1%. Um, they've lifted 2023, 20, 2024. Growth, they've downgraded to 2.8% from 3.7%. Um, so they were your forecast. But actually now, when you look at it, the, the euro has yeah. reversed that move and nice. some. Um, so the one thing I always find with, Christine Lagarde is <laughs> traders just seem to have it so locked in their head that whatever she says, yeah, it's like uh, she's she's tries to claw away at reinstilling like some degree of credibility. But I don't know if it's because people didn't see her as a credible actor in the first instance, given she's had a little bit of a a bumpy political history before taking this this seat yeah. at the helm of the ECB. It's almost like people have started with a in the investment community. I mean, with a yeah. negative psyche and how they view her communication. Yeah, and therefore that always it seems like a bit of a reoccurring theme whenever there's an ECB press conference. I definitely um, think you're right, there, and it's like unfair on her. I I would probably say, and but yeah, you're right. There's this kind of unspoken just uncertainty and unease about mm. her and her ability to, I guess what, the other thing is not just about her as an individual and her history. She was previously head of the IMF and um, politically very well connected. And um, so it's not necessarily just about her, but do, do remember she's following in some pretty <laughs> big footsteps with, with your man, Mario Draghi, um, who, I mean, I think it's a bit of a legend. So I think, 
to try and follow in his footsteps is an incredibly difficult job. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's still a little bit of a trust issue between markets and Lagarde. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, the euro is selling off now. I mean, it's that is new lows for the day, but it's not a massive move. I mean, we're just testing the low from yesterday right now. I'm just looking at the chart. But um, so, so really, um, you know, the euro dollar, I you think know, in looking over the last, well, obviously this year has dropped off massively, um, but we have bounced over the last month. So we, I think the low of the year so far was about 103.50, if I'm just going to round it, 103.50. Um, and we traded up. We, we've been trading around the 107 handle for the last couple of weeks. And we're still in the tight little range, even though there's been a lot of volatility today. The size of the range today is not particularly large at this point. Um, so we're still in that consolidation range after that little bounce that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. So look, I think this is just quite a noisy intraday market reaction to a kind of uh, an event that's pretty much as expected. Um, I don't think there's too much of a surprise. I know they, I know they said we may go larger if inflation warrants. Well, of course they will. And um, you know, we talked about that last week. I think they should go larger if inflation warrants because the Fed's going larger. So you know, that's your door to trying to raise rates at a higher clip. And I said, but you know, in some ways, being the pessimist again, you know, the higher you can raise rates now, the more you can cut when the recession comes right but so i don't think this this is kind of a lot of intraday volatility around this event but in the end i don't think too much has changed um in terms of the medium term outlook for the european economy or the euro's value um along with that cool all right well look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there and um don't forget to to check out the show notes i'll also put the link to our daily newsletter because there's been lots of other things that have gone on this week, which obviously we don't have time to cover everything, like Boris Johnson surviving uh, his no confidence vote. Um, he's going to potentially rewrite legislation overriding the Brexit bill. There's Russian still forceful um, activity happening in Donbass, in Ukraine. There's Elon Musk flip flopping. Now he's employing more people after he said cutting 10%. He's now, Twitter are now giving him access to the data he's requested. Now he's gone a bit quiet. So yeah, there's a whole ton of stuff that's um, super interesting. So we cover that all in the daily newsletter, myself and the team. So, you know, obviously free to subscribe to, check it out. Um, I'll put it in the, the show notes. And yeah, thank you, Piers. And uh, enjoy Palm Beach. Yeah, I'm just going to just gonna trot down for a swim in the ocean. <laughs> See you later. Thanks, Piers. See you later. <laughs>